Good morning, everybody. This is the December uh, 16th <laughs> uh, SNU Generative Writing Workshop with some of my favorite alumni. If I did a better job of telling the class that we were doing this, I bet some would show up. Um, we are not going to talk about what's happening in the classes today, uh, just because nobody here needs that advice. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind that the most important sensory detail you can include in your writing is smell. That's, that's my thing that I do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have two poems for us to work on today as inspiration to write from. And one, if you're with me on social media, you probably, or with Birch Bark, you probably have seen this one because I posted it this week, but I love it so much that we have to use it. And then the next one's from E.E. E. Cummings, and I feel like it pairs with this one. So that's why I chose these for us to work from today. So in the chat, oh no, God, no, come on, people. In the chat <laughs> is this poem by Abby Murray, and it's called Ode to an Invasive Species. And since I can barely speak today with my scratchy throat, that is not sickness. I don't know what it is. Uh, would somebody else please volunteer to read this? <clears throat> I got Randall, you. you have the best voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Randall. Ode to an invasive species. My friend reminds me cats are an invasive species, citing every songbird she's found disemboweled on her doorstep. What she means is feeding one animal is the same as killing another. And what I mean is I don't know how to unlove a thing once I love it. I used to think shame could teach me, but here I am, still dumbstruck by the generator in my cat's tiny throat, the one she cranks to life in exchange for any kindness I show her, offering me her own broken song. Here I am, smacking a sparrow from her mouth, then giving it water in a shoebox where it can rest because I want it all, my version of peace everywhere, which I think makes me an invasive species too. I spend most days trying to be good while knowing I'm not, not completely, and trying not to be crushed even though I couldn't live without deserving it. How awesome is that? Sorry. I thought considering the presence of beautiful furry things that often show up in these Zoom calls, <laughs> that this would be particularly meaningful to our group. <laughs> Randall, do you have cats? No. No. Elisa, you don't, do you? My daughter kidnapped him when she left for college, so I just have the dog. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this is, of course, not entirely about a cat. And this is something I was talking about today when I was responding to some discussion boards. There's something of a more existential quality going on here, right? Something about like why we live or how we live, maybe. What is what is going on with Abby E. Murray in this? That you should live like you deserve it. Yeah. Because living causes what? This is great, Sarah living causes living or death yeah and it causes like for you to be alive something else is going to be harmed right and what would be some claims people would make that you don't have to harm something else by living like what could you do not to harm something else be vegan sure but you're still ripping carrots out of the ground right they've proven that you know like plants know they're dying i mean that's a little sentient of me but i mean there's <laughs> it, <laughs> vegan is complicated too what else though like you could be vegan and we're talking about being literal there which is great she what she means is feeding one animal is the same as killing another how do we stay warm She asks while running an electric heater under her desk at this very moment. <laughs> You're talking about like the environment? Yeah, I'm Maybe. trying to get at everything. Environment. Yeah. I mean, everything's codependent. I mean, we, we're, we're, not, we're not in a vacuum. Right. When I lived in Maryland, my house was heated by oil. I was mm -hmm. like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I didn't even know that was still a thing, right? Um to i don't know um to eat bread what dies 
the flour, the yeast. Sure. The bugs that were in the wheat, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to run electricity for how many years in Washington did these dams exist before they figured out they needed to put fish ladders up because they were killing all the salmon, right? Because their mm -hmm. spawning grounds were above, yeah. So what I'm getting at is it seems like Abby Murray understands that for one person to say, domestic cats and this this is a fact domestic cats are the number one killers of songbirds in america that's that's just a statistic that seems to be true um but is that worth not having domestic cats can we even separate it out can we even say well cats are invasive species so we shouldn't have them i see well, Suzanne it, shaking her head. yeah parrot i had parrots like and if you watch the movie rio or different things it makes it seem like having a parrot is like the most horrible thing you could do to another creature because you're taking something that should be free and putting it in a cage sure and owning horses you take something that should be wild and putting it in a pasture. You're like, do you see what I'm getting? At? Right. So I love that she heads this, puts this head on. And I love, Elisa, by the way, that you said cats are not allowed on any British royal property. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Um, she says, uh, I don't know how to unlove a thing once I love it. And then she says, here I am still dumbstruck by the generator in my cat's tiny throat. Any of us who have loved cats are like, yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I don't want to stop having cats because they're wonderful. And mine don't get to kill songbirds, though at four o'clock in the morning, yesterday morning, one killed a mouse <laughs> outside and brought it into the house. We have a catio, you know, that they can mm -hmm. be in. So they can't get the songbirds, but they can get the mice at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> okay, so that's really literal. And I was getting at, of course, as Sarah pointed out, you know, the environment, like, you know, this is that we're all um, interdependent, codependent, we're all part of the same world. And the life of something causes the death of something else in the world that we're in. Yeah, the butterfly effect, Sarah. Yeah. And so thinking about that, you know, um, let's go down to Oh, <laughs> did not put it in the chat how can you go down to the prompt that i'm about to work with you on if it's not there hold on here we go in the prompt which i will read to you i ask what is an invasive species and then i know since you've all been in SNU, <laughs> in the same way that vonnegut has a handicapper general diana moon glampers in harrison bergeron who decides what is invasive and then in your own either built world like fantasy sci-fi right here in the real world pick an invasive species and write about your love hate of the plant animal and then i give you a question mark on mineral you know can a mineral be invasive <laughs> i see suzanne nodding why do you say so oh it can ruin soil quality um and impact like everything so everything can be invasive <laughs> right and and humans are really good at like we, we brought cats, <laughs> we can move minerals, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to think about there. Um, so you get it. And what's fun is that so many of you have worlds that you've built. You could literally create something invasive in the world that's part of your world building. So um, you could do that or you can look around you. I mean, I can't help but think that Elise is going to say something about an algae bloom based on her <laughs> recent <laughs> problems. But I don't know. I don't know what she'll write about. And uh, Sarah, am I right? It, it took the state 24 hours to get back to me about the algae bad. bloom. And then I said, well, it's already gone down the, you know, the lake. It's no longer at my house. And they're like, well, do you know where it is? I'm like, no. <laughs> come find it <laughs> come find, but they said they did know that there's tons that there's a bloom in this in the lake well um, good and sarah you might write about parrots i don't know um but i'm sure you all have an idea and i'm sure i have a timer whoa 
that's no longer charging. Um, so six minutes, everybody. <laughs> Go ahead and start writing.
You have a minute left. I can't believe your time is up already. I muted you all so that we could be very quiet for each other. Sorry, I was having a uh, argument with my with my son because we watched Man of Steel last night and the point where the cape flutters in space. And I said to my son, you know, that wouldn't really happen because there's no air, so there's no wind, so nothing would flutter in space. So now he's sending me pictures of things with sails like the Hub telescope and saying, does this count? Because he's 25 going on three. <laughs> and he can't, he can't admit that his mother had a point and was scientifically correct. <laughs> Uh, did you get some writing done too, or was your son yes, your invasive species? <laughs> He's been muted. I told him I'll, I'll, I'll discuss it. I sent him a picture of the USS Enterprise and told him I'd talk to him at 11. That's funny. Okay. how to go for the rest of you? Sarah, I muted everybody, so you're muted. There you go. I don't want to stop. <laughs> okay, don't stop. <laughs> that's exciting. I love that. Does that mean you want to read? Because that sounds exciting. Sure. Can you read? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, don't be an Eric, the help sheet declares. Eric throws extra crickets, worms, and even bearded dragons out into a field. They either become the invasive species or attract another species to become invasive. Hawks love to eat lizards. They soar on beautiful wings, crying out as they swoop down to clutch a released, a released beardy in its death-gripping claws. Releasing the dragon into the nest maybe to feed its young, while the whole reason it was initially released was because some bratty kid decided he or she didn't want to take care of their Christmas present that shouldn't have been a present at all. Red tail hawks are everywhere in central Texas and central Wisconsin. Their regalness posting on power line poles as on power line poles. As a driver watching a red tail hawk launch, I almost crashed into the median of a highway. Perhaps my dead body would have brought in invasive carnivore species. All because some extra bugs and reptiles. <laughs> Hold on. I like the interconnectedness that you offered us. I like the beautiful wings and the like beautiful description, but he's swooping up and grabbing the the bearded dragon. Um, like the, the opposition of that really, whoops, really, really, I like that. It was like such a contrast of like, you know, and I sit here and I see eagles flying outside my house all the time and they grab up the fish and it's, it really is like such a ju juxtaposition of like their beauty, but they're not.
Yeah, they're predators. Right. Suzanne said the dead body and more invasive species and that it's a great circle of life. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I really like how you're like, okay, like here's this invasive thing and then, but like here's the life it brings, but then you like keep doing the circle of it being like, okay, well, this is like kind of bad news, but like look at the good that this is doing for it because, you know, baby, baby hawks need to eat. <laughs> so like, I like that you go, um, like steps almost like, like dominoes right uh, yeah it was really good i liked it also like that you kind of that interconnectedness you kind of created a a sense of how invasiveness is a perspective thing in a lot of ways and it's a label that we've put on something that ultimately you know it's a quote unquote unnatural process we might view it as but then when you talk about a dead body feeding invasive carnivores, that also kind of reminds you, hey, we're not really disconnected from this as much as we sometimes pretend that we are. You know, we're still part of this process. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. Like bringing the person back in really brought that home that, you know, it is a subjective thing. Yeah. Elisa has offered us a photo of a, what kind bearded of dragon. bearded dragon? And Sarah, what do you have now? A bearded dragon that's probably a third the size of that, if that. <laughs> Still a baby. Yeah. I hope that's... that we get to that point. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, she volunteered at the rescue center for a little bit, so we hosted him while he was recuperating from whatever. And she Is just walked fun? around him with him on her head like that. It's adorable. They're a lot more fun than you would think. Although I've had parrots are hard animals to have. Um, but bearded dragon is definitely the most difficult animal I've ever had. And that's saying a lot because I've had a lot of different animals. That's weird. I wouldn't have expected that. Yeah. Well, for one thing, you have to feed their food. You mean like they have something alive to eat and you have to feed the thing that they're eating? Yeah. Oh. And they're like picky. So like you have to have like four different kinds of worms and crickets and roaches and like then you have to feed all of these things. And then like, but it um make sure that you have enough because they're gonna want they're like cats. You like feed them one thing one day and it's like their favorite thing. So you go and get a bunch of it and then they can't want it anymore. And it's like <laughs> my daughter had to give him a bath once a week because apparently they poop only when they're swimming or something so it was it was something about like maybe because he was older I don't remember but he had to be soaked in the bathtub once a week for like an hour hmm. and, you know she was what 12 or 13 and it was just like did you remember to clean out the tub when you were done <laughs> they are easy like it only goes once a day and so super easy to clean up after but anyway just don't let the roaches loose right <laughs> yeah i'm more freaked out about the crickets that they're not like nasty house roaches they're more like sow bugs if you know what those are um they're not like icky house roaches okay. anyway good <laughs> well who wants to follow that I can, I can go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, Lisa. Uh, for years we want. For years we wanted her. Begged. I wanted her. I begged for her. I cried for her. But no, we didn't need another mouth to feed. I was trapped with the kids we had. I was worn out. He traveled too much. He couldn't help. It was too wet to walk. Too cold. Too snowy. He couldn't help. He couldn't help. He couldn't help. He couldn't help. And then he moved us across the country and she was the bribe I used to agree. It's better weather, you're closer to commute to home, no hour long commute, you'll have a eight to six, you'll help more, you'll help more, you'll help more. And still he held out for three more years until I nagged and nagged and nagged. And after a boring vacation at Hancock's Boring Rock, 
we stopped at the Tacoma shelter and welcomed her into our lives. And she bled seamlessly into every aspect, every walk, every moment of our lives until she and I and him and the kids were a unit. And now she's old and slowed it down with hip trouble and old age, doggy old age. And there's a dark tunnel looming and he is the most devastated of all. I can't live without my Lana. I don't know how. She's our invasive species. Aww. <laughs> I know, right? No, uh, my... Go ahead, Suzanne. Oh, no, no, they live forever. <laughs> right. No. That dark tunnel, I said loaming, but I meant looming. Um, mm -hmm. That was my favorite line of the whole thing. The sense that to get through something awful has to be a journey because a tunnel has to be gone through, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and even if you come out the other side, of course, that doesn't mean that you're over it. It just means that you've figured out how to make it part of your life. But um, adorable that Mr. No is the one that's the most upset. Exactly. <laughs> So funny to watch. There were some other thoughts happening in the chat. Does anybody have anything you want to add verbally? I really like the repetition. I think it worked really, really well. And even though you used it a lot, it wasn't like, okay, we get it. It like worked really well. Like it flowed really well. Thank you. Because she only used it three times. And in fact, the need needed to be repeated four times because um, the other two had been repeated four times. You're running out of time. I get it. Um, but it, it was almost comforting, I think, to a reader. Like we knew what you were doing, but we wanted it by that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like sometimes repeating makes it stand still, but it seemed like it actually made it move forward. Yeah. Yep. Randall, any thoughts? The repetition was my favorite part of it because I feel like it was uh, where it wasn't just a once off. It happened several times throughout. It made it very aware that it was a conscious choice to use it as a rep repetitive uh, literary device. So I like that you did that. But the tunnel thing was, you know, a very good. That was my. I, I, I agree with those. So that like that's the best metaphor in it. I feel like. Yeah. I felt like also there was just the repetition maybe suggested either a narrative or maybe especially a character arc meaning yeah. that the husband character in this is you know like no and then he's like oh no and then he's like heartbroken and so I feel like the repetition helped us trace maybe a shift in the way that this guy approached his family mm -hmm. and that your invasive species helped that happen yeah which yeah. is kind of nice Cool. We'll bring her over, but she's fast asleep. Yeah, you let those hips be rested. <laughs> well, thank you for um, a really, I think, an interesting take on this this topic for sure. Yeah. Who's next? I think Suzanne was ready to go. Randall, oh. you're just stuck bringing up the rear again. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, the Belizean paced around the room. His wings topped up against his back. His tail stiff and only the top twitched. A low rumble escaped his throat as Pip sniffed at the disinfected wounds and bandages covering my shoulder. I've had Pip since he was a cub, no larger than a house cat. He was abandoned, my father had said, as he wiped his bleeding knuckles. Pip was supposed to be wild and live across the sea, but he followed along like a shadow, trying to fly his stubby wings or catch varmints that graced the castle walls. He grew, like all things do. No creature was safe from his jaws. He was resourceful and fast to the detriment of bringing large creatures that were still alive for the guards to round up. He just wanted to share his love. <laughs> I don't know your characters, but I loved the detail about the father's bloody knuckles, because we know. <laughs> Sarah said tribute we've suffered through no that was the other that one. was yeah 
no creature was safe from his jaws and he wanted to share his love from Melissa. What else? I got this great image of a dragon with the uh, personality of a cat. So like rather yeah. than bringing dead birds, it brings dead horses and lays them on your doorstep. So that, cra <laughs> that cracked me up. Thank I you for interested. choosing horses. <laughs> <laughs> dead sheep, dead cows, dead goats, <laughs> dead horses. <laughs> um, I think adding a fantastical aspect to it was expected from you but unexpected well not unexpected that you did so well with it but like I wouldn't have been able to do well putting that into a fantasy quickly um so I think that you did that really well um because your skill is developing so well so <laughs> and yeah. And I, I think it is a tribute to how well Suzanne knows her world, the world she's built, that she mm -hmm. can just immediately throw an invasive species into it is because that world like exists in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Randall, were you adding? Oh, no, you did the horses. Do you have anything else? No. Okay. Suzanne, that was fun and great. And I had, I can't help it. I had toothless in mind because this one, this, you know, it wasn't a fully accomplished dragon yet. And so that made me think of Toothless, of course. I loved Toothless. <laughs> You're we used to get, cold hearted if you don't. <laughs> we got the books. So they came, came out, the books came out in England before they came out here. So I'd always have my cousins get us the book and ship them over. So, and we always needed to have two copies, one for my son and one for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Randall? <laughs> All right. I started to write one on a conversation we've been having, but I decided to skip on it first. We've been, me and Jesse have been talking about how Dollar Generals are an invasive species because they're oh popping up all God. over the country. Oh my and God. We're, we're working on that as one of the pieces for our anthology as uh, Dollar Generals as an invasive species. I, I started to write on that, but I decided to wait since we're mid process on it. Okay. So I got something <laughs> different for you. I just had to share because it, it was so funny that that came up. Yeah, I'm with Suzanne. Read them both. <laughs> <laughs> the Lucernian monks perfected the invocation of Ikkyo's blood many centuries ago. By invoking her name over a properly blessed charm, they could summon through the tiniest droplets of her vate. It severs divers purpose, serves divers' purposes from cleansing water to healing wounds. Some of a more heretical bent may claim it can raise the dead, but this requires a purity of purpose far beyond any man. However, the church leaders will not tell you the full truth. They would have you remain ignorant of the fact that Ikkyo is corrupted by her despair, that her invocations prod her in her misery, like a barber involuntarily bleeding a choleric prisoner. She rails at their touch, and her utter hopelessness manifests through the oozing pustules at the corners of her cage. Like a rotting songbird, she sings, healing and damning at the same time. It is a hard truth, but Ikkyo is the source of the gloom. Excerpted from the Histories of Bast, Chapter 6. <laughs> I was typing. <laughs> She's the source of the gloom? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, isn't that like the major setting character in your whole... Mm -hmm. I feel like we just got given the biggest secret. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, slightly. Spoiler alert, but... <laughs> Did you already know this? Yes. Okay. All right. I see Suzanne nodding like, yeah, I already knew it too. <laughs> but I liked how you tied her into being an invasive species, even though it was like their fault for like capturing her and that songbird worked so well. Cause I thought about like, like the canaries in the mines or even like, um, like there's another imagery that I lost because I saw it from the mouth of canaries, but like, trapping it for its detriment even though it's supposed to be wild oh that was so good i like the way her blood works two ways and i'm missing something in the story because i've been gone so long so I'm, I'm not quite with the flow but i love I, the way that her blood is both good and bad and I, it seemed to be more like it was also dependent on her mood like because she's depressed or not depressed it's just like 
I like the what like that a lot. I did too. Sarah, do you have anything you want to add? No, I need to see it in writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really complicated, which I'm always impressed that you can do in six minutes. And I got a little lost because I wanted to type in the whole like a barber involuntarily bleeding a choleric prisoner. But just even as I was typing it, I was like, that is complicated because then I lost the rotting songbird, which was, I think, the most important image in the whole thing, especially because if we're seeing this as an invasive species, I think contemporary readers will recognize the relationship between like cats killing songbirds. And then as Suzanne said, the canary in the coal mine and mm -hmm. the idea that the canary is our indicator that something's going wrong, you know, like all of that's tied into it. It's a really good um, image symbol, something like that. Y'all continuing to blow me away. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so are you ready to move on to E.E. E. Cummings? Yes. He's one of my favorite uh, poets, or he was at least when I was in my 20s. Um, and he's got some amazingly cool stuff out there. Like um, there's this really kind of erotic poem that starts, I don't know the name of it, but his poems are mostly named by the first lines. And it's something like, I like my body when it's with your body, something more, right? Um, the something more is like the third line, but I, the stuff in between, I should not record. So I recommend that you Google E.E. E. Cummings. I like my body when it's with your body. It's a, it's a awesome read. And this person told me about it. Uh, he was TDY to Turkey where I was stationed and I was, you know, it was my job to take him to dinner because he was like a public affairs boss. And he was like, oh, you're an English major. You should read this poem. <laughs> and I found it way harder back in 1996, right? There, there was no Google. <laughs> there was no way to, right? When I found it, I was like, hmm, <laughs> should he have been telling me to read this poem? <laughs> anyway, um, so I know we don't all celebrate Christmas and this isn't so much about Christmas as the symbol of a um, like festive time. And I actually, because the, the prompt will have to do with the idea that it's um, not just a, like a religious or a Christmas thing. But here is Little Tree. Does anybody want to read it? <clears throat> I'll go again. Okay, great. Little tree, little silent Christmas tree, you're so little. You're more like a flower who found you in the green forest. And were you very sorry to come away? See, I will comfort you because you smell so sweetly. I will kiss your cool bark and hug you safe and tight, just as your mother would. Only don't be afraid. Look at the spangles that sleep all the year in a dark box, dreaming of being taken out and allowed to shine. The balls, the chains, red and gold, the fluffy threads, Put up your little arms and I'll give them all to you to hold. Every finger shall have its ring and there won't be a single place dark or unhappy. Right. <laughs> what are your thoughts? What do you want to talk about with this poem? I just want to cuddle the tree. <laughs> That's a very positive perspective on it. Does anybody have a different way to take it? <laughs> very dark with that imagery especially I've been watching a lot of criminal minds and it feels like someone is abducting this like small child yeah. and like <laughs> dressing them up for how they want to see them and so it went very creepy oh my <laughs> and and honestly reading E.E. E. Cummings often very creepy is an appropriate way to read him he also is also not creepy but I I had the same feeling with this one any other thoughts? No, I just thought he was like a little child and he was dressing it up and he needed to give it a hug. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends on your perspective. Dark and creepy. Yeah. I mean, you can, I mean, this is why you have reader interaction with pieces, yeah. right? Suzanne's been watching Criminal Minds. Elisa likes a nice and happy holiday. <laughs> Any yeah. other thoughts from my outliers, Sarah and Randall? The sleep it all the year in a dark box dreaming of being taken out and allowed to shine creeps me out. 
the balls, the chains. <laughs> That's the next slide. Because I feel like we just stepped into a different poem. Kind of. Yeah. I I'm not I'm not disagreeing at all. I'm just letting you say what you're gonna say. Randall? <laughs> I'm still I'm still trying to decide which side of that I fall on because I can there's that's kind of what I like about it is you've got so many so many ways to read it in both directions. I agree. I agree. You are so little, like little tree, little silent Christmas tree. You are so little. <laughs> I kind of feel like part of the part of the meaning swings on the relationship of the narrator to the mother. Because if this is a father, you know, it becomes you know, more of a heartwarming thing, but if it's an abductor or something, it's obviously not quite so much. So right. you are more like a flower who found you in the green forest. And when, were you very sorry to come away? I mean, it is a little bit of a commentary on what like trees are not flowers, right? Uh, <clears throat> At a minimum, he's saying something about how we retrieve Christmas trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. See, I will comfort you. Did did anybody take pause? Like, how does a Christmas tree come away? Like, how did that tree leave the forest? You butcher it. Yeah, you have to chop it down. <laughs> have you ever driven through like Squim and Port Townsend and that side of the Olympic? Yeah, community? my grandparents it's used like to a, live there graveyard for trees because that's where the the mills are and like we went through it my heart was crying because you just see these logs and logs and logs and I was just like my poor babies yeah so um were you very sorry to come away see I will comfort you because you smell so sweetly how do you comfort something that's already been chopped down <laughs> Just, I, I think I fall deeply on the side of dark <laughs> with this one, including this order of saying, you know, of the things that sleep all year and dream of being taken out, the balls, the chains, right? Like ball and chain got put in that order for a reason. So in my reading of it, he's like, I have some questions about what we do for this holiday, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I don't deny that he's saying, there's reasons we love it, right? I mean, just the smell of a fresh Christmas tree. Who does not love the smell of a fresh Christmas tree? I mean, I love walking into a house and smelling that. It's been years since I've done that, but um, partly because I have young cats. Um, but well, and when you're in the military, you just get a fake tree because you never know where you're going to be. <laughs> so I've had a fake tree for probably 20 years. Um, but there's, you know, definitely we're talking about what we love about the season two and I think he's complicating it and I thought it was the perfect pair with Abby Murray's piece because she's complicating our love for invasive species for cats right and then taking it to kind of existential meaning so for the prompt <clears throat> which I will read Murray writes that feeding one animal is the same as killing another Coming seems to move through the same thoughts, describing the tree as more like a flower and asks, were you very sorry to come away? What small guilt is Cummings portraying and what possible ways is he trying to assuage them? And then for you, what rituals, festivals, ceremonies do you find complicated now that were simple in your youth? Um, and I mean anything. It does not have to be the winter holidays. It can be anything. And then pick a detail from one of them and write your way around those complicated feelings. So what is something that you understand differently now than you understood when you were a small child? And write about kind of why you see it differently now. What makes it hard? Does that make sense? Do y'all have any kind of rituals in mind? They could be religious rituals. They could be uh, ceremonies you used to have at school, right? You know, ways that we celebrated things at school. They could be Christmas, I mean, birthday parties. I mean, it could be anything, right? That now you're like, oh, that was uncool. Like all the commercials now about what moms get for Christmas because the moms make Christmas happen according to these commercials. You know, that's complicated if you understand that 
Christmas only happened because somebody was killing themselves to make it happen, right? Okay, you all have ideas um, on your marks, get set, right.
Do you have a minute left? Time's up. How'd it go? Was this one as fun as I thought it could be, or was it too hard to think of something? Nope. I thought it was going to be too hard, but it came okay. Oh, good. I'm excited to hear that. I just wanted you to know I managed to submit a piece while we were while you were writing. Nice. <laughs> Cuz it got rejected uh yesterday. So I sent it somewhere else. That's what we do. It's just the place I sent it to first. It's perfect for. They just don't realize it. They're lost. Yeah, hopefully. I have a I think I told you guys that I have a piece coming out um the first Friday of January with Booth Magazine. And it's the one that that was my 33rd submission. <laughs> I mean, in, in whatever form, the piece has been revised a lot. But I think it was maybe the 10th or 11th version, you know, 10th or 11th time in this version. And it finally got picked up. And Booth is like, for me, that's a huge, you know, like it's a magazine I really care about. So. Keep Is trying. it online or paper? I think it'll be online. I know that the, I mean, I know it'll be online. I know that they publish a paper journal. I don't know if it's in the paper journal or not, but I'm still proud that they picked me no matter what, because they're a hard, hard market, I think, to get into. <clears throat> On that bragging note, <laughs> who would like to go? I think oh, Randall should go first for once. Yeah. Okay. Some ideas are simpler when you don't think about them. I looked in every corner of the baptistry, but I couldn't find the stain of sin. I don't even know what said stain looks like. There's a watermark, a ring around the outside, but that can't be it. I've seen those at home, and that's just for scrubbing away dirt and BO. It can't be the same, can it? Yet the water from both tubs came from the same fluoride-treated supply. It flowed through the same PVC from the same Lowe's installed by the same hardworking blue collar men. When does the bread become the body and the wine become the blood? Is it when the rapt, innocent eyes of youth staring up at the cross become the undead eyes of a zombie staring with uncomprehending or jaded eyes at the symbol of faith or faith ridiculousness? The zombie is resurrected and cleansed by his faith in his undead God. I'll stick to my shower at home. <laughs> all right your thoughts i love that what about it back that up with what you loved oh, so i'm also writing about religious water and to me it was the 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 concept that it's the same water that you get in your bathtub mm -hmm. and so the description with the rim, the the rim, you know, of of and have the PVC pipes. The, so it took everything out of like the religious and brought it back into reality. So I'm nice. really bad, writing, yeah. But kind of, you know, that's what I like. Maybe think of two things at first. Like one is that, like 
you have to wash your bathtub because some people get a ring around their bathtub. So you still have like the mark of sin even in your bathtub if you extend it that far. And also like living in a college dorm, like having to like wear flip flops in the shower because you don't want someone else's nasty on you. Um, were the two things that came to mind um, with that. And that um, at the beginning, it sounded like it was likely the narrator was a child because they took it so literally. Um, but those are my thoughts. Yeah, and I want to hop in because Sarah went exactly where I did and keep going with it. If <laughs> humans were to maintain um like it takes human intervention to create the perception of that miracle of that water being sin free mm -hmm. they would have to actually do a better job of scrubbing out that line because it's it's just a representation and if you know if this is true or isn't true depending on people's beliefs and we have all kinds of beliefs in here but um it's the, a human job to have that perception like all religion that we have is filtered through humans and so randall seems to be noting that <laughs> if it's the same as what i have at home then what's the miracle in that right and yeah. that's that's pretty cool and i suspect i i wrote this trying to say it could be anything like you could talk about discovering that santa claus isn't real am i hurting what? anybody <laughs> uh, santa claus is embodied by question? different people yes <laughs> yeah can i ask uh, an ignorant question what's that so the water for the mikvah for the ritual bath is ground water that's why they're always at the bottom of a building and somewhere they're not tap water it's ground it's lake water i mean you can go and use the lake if you want to do it's it's not tap fed the waters at the in the church and the baptistries and all that is that just regular tap water? Oh yeah, it's a bathtub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, even groundwater. The only difference is that it's not run through a pipe to a tap. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, but it's it's mm, technically there's like more complications to it than just saying groundwater. Sure, water, I, I'm just saying. For example, I have groundwater in my house because we have a well. Right. <laughs> so but it runs through pvc pipe yeah yeah no no it goes through pipes and stuff but it's not it's it's not coming out of a faucet where it's being treated and right blah right. blah blah right but i mean all water is groundwater it just it what phase of it are you getting it from right yeah, yeah. more thoughts on randall we have so many in here i know somebody wants to talk about the eyes and the zombie I really like the eyes and the juxtaposition because I didn't write it more down because I was like just so stuck on the eyes. I think you said like the I like basically like the innocence of a child and then you went to the zombie, right, Randall? Mm -hmm. That like shift, I loved that. Um, I thought it worked really well, especially when you're talking about like the um, different juxtapositions of every, all of the things. And so great job. I really like this one. And I felt like to jump on Suzanne's idea, <laughs> that showed a transition in the character too. Like the character used to see this as a holy figure. And then the more mature the char character becomes, the more the character's like, you know, I play video games where there are zombies and <laughs> I'm reminded of that now. And it just shows the change, like the growth in the character that helps helps unveil the mystery for this person you know choose the person choosing to pull back a curtain and see what what he wants to see there right he being said because randall wrote it but it could be anybody does anybody else get worried when they look out the window and their husband has the hood up on their truck and we already have one truck in the shop oh god <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we have three more people who wrote amazing stuff. I can go next. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. It was only supposed to be a quick dunk, water to purify and wash the sins away to be reborn. Wrinkly fingers were supposed to draw a cross on one cheek and a butterfly on another so that you would be able to share the life 
but in a sense, the love with your family. It didn't matter that you didn't agree with the stories or harsh words that poisoned the water that you're about to be reborn in. It didn't matter that the anxiety would claw at your chest and it would spoil the milk you had at breakfast. And it didn't matter that you would draw on your hands, your dress, your program, and your own blood when trying to ground yourself because you don't want to be planted in a forest where you're sh you were sure not to get the sunlight you needed to bloom. It was almost supposed to be a quick dunk as they tried to drown you too. <sighs> <laughs> awesome everybody I don't know if it's exactly what you were going for in the end but I've got this very powerful image of um, the idea that like you know it's a quick dunk but it's also like an attempt to destroy a part of who you are as a person because it's you know these things are not okay by this religious code and you will abandon them and that's part of it and that's kind of Maybe that's my contingent reality, or maybe that is what you intended. But, you know, that's that was very powerful to me. I, I like that. Again, the, the water, and but the water is like, you know, it's like it's supposed to wash you away, but it was also poisonous and it's also going to kill her. And like the two two sidedness of it, like, you know, Every, it's, it's upending everything we know about water being, you know, life giving and everything. And it just, you know, we're on the same theme today of, uh, you know, water so far. But I really liked it, and I liked the 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 sunlight that you deserve because they're taking one thing, but they're, you know, they're taking one life giving force away by dunking her. But they're, you know, it's it's being crossed with also not getting her the other life force that she deserves or he deserves it. It makes me think um, you were at the author um, in conversation thing last Tuesday. Was it just last Tuesday? Um, Jean and Brian, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the lady, my favorite line that she said was like, uh, she had like a hard time or something and she is wa in the shower washing the words off of her body like I thought that that was amazing and that's kind of like what your writing made me reminded me of because like taking what you were before and changing it or supposedly if you believe so changing it into something different yeah, I could see an older version of this character in the shower having this thought, you know what I mean? Like washing away this experience. And I agree with Elisa in that um, both you were planted in a forest where you were sure not to get the sunlight you needed to bloom so you wouldn't thrive. Um, and that is a smothering, a, a kind of death type of thing. And then the other one is a quick dunk while they tried to drown you too. And so in both cases, these this symbolic meaning of being baptized for this character is a form of death. And that's a, a fascinating direction to go because it's, of course, supposed to give the character everlasting life, right? And so um, that juxtaposition is important and it would be interesting to see where you keep taking this. I mean, I, I definitely think it's something you want to keep working on. Definitely. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so we're down to Sarah and Elisa. Which of you two want to go? I want to go last. Okay, Elisa. All that right. means it's you. <laughs> so getting ready to marry the morning before I went to the mikveh as I was required to purify before the big day. The place was filthy. The Rebbitson was rude. They scrubbed my skin, removed my nail polish, took off any scabs, opening my skin, lest something come between me and the body of holy water. I dunked three times, said the blessing, got my note to pass to the rabbi. The mortification level rose, but I went home and I cleansed myself. Rather than going back every month, I did not go again for 25 years. 
until after a spectacularly shitty year, I thought, why not? The place was lovely. The Robertson was nice. I had already gone with naked nails and suffered no scab removals. I dunked three times and burst into tears. Taking place of a mother, she held me and let me cry it out. And all was good until the lecture started. So we'll see you next month, she said. And I've not been back in seven years. I'm writing. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> so lots of water, Suzanne. I there after you start talking about like the scabs and nothing coming in between you and the holy water, I like got lost in like this imagery and just like thinking about this character at this moment who's and then like just like thinking about like people like taking off your scabs when it hurts, um, to try to like wash you. And when I say I got lost, it was like lost in a good way. Um, like I would definitely need to like reread this a couple of times because like it stuck with me. And then I think Sarah mentioned this is like when you really like something, you just like kind of thinking about it for a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, but then that, that ending of but I haven't been back in seven years. Oof. Yep. It's interesting. I assume that this process is supposed to be a beautiful thing it is but taking scabs off is not a beautiful thing so and so it kind of like is like hey what you're walking into is beautiful and painful so they actually make special, you know, mikvah appointments for brides because it'll be your first time and they explain it to you and they do take your scabs off and everything. But if you have a mother who doesn't give a shit and just chooses the cheapest place possible and doesn't make an appointment and you get there and then you're like, oh, yeah, I need my note. And then you have to pass it on to the rabbi who's known you since you were six to prove that you've been pure. It was just traumatic but you know my sisters everyone in my family they the yeshiva world they all found after my experience found better places and they've gone you know every month clockwork and they love it but i just think it was just like a, such a shitty first experience that i was like I'm, I'm i'm never going back randall do you have anything to add i think there's something really complicated in the in the part about the scabs and the water because scabs are a form of healing they're healing that's in process and to me the removal of the scabs is almost this uh this symbolic manifestation of you know reopening wounds that were in the process of healing and you know destroying the process that had already been underway and i think it's further complicated by the the return when you mm -hmm. when when the character goes back the second time and the character doesn't go through quite as much of that initial pain and has almost, it seems like more of a, a potentially gratitude based response to the, to the tradition. So I, I think that's kind of interesting because whereas mine was very callous and almost, well, not almost cynical, you know, yours was more of like, you know, a mixed emotions thing. And I, I, I don't know. I'll appreciated that. I thought that was interesting. I would love to hear from the rest of you if you agree with me and you don't have to, obviously, um, that Elisa has a really important essay that she hasn't written yet about this. But we've heard about the seven years not been back before. We've heard about the aunt that kind of stood in for a mother. And we've heard about the conflicts with this mother before. Like all of these things have existed in the writing that Elisa has done with us in this group. And Elisa, I really think that you uh, it's important for you to write through what's going on. I mean, this might be your memoir because <laughs> you also are having a complicated relationship with at least one daughter. And so I think that um, like the mother making those kinds of choices on your behalf, there's something to do with, uh, it's something to do with also um, purity. It's it, There's a sex thing going on here as well, because if the person doesn't have this until they're getting married it's supposed to mean that it's happening to a virgin for the first time yes. and um 
it, it it's very violating seeming this whole thing is violating it's as if it's a, a rape scene of a wedding night before the wedding so I just feel like there's a lot for you to explore to crack open to take these themes in the natural and kind of dark direction like don't be the guy that's hugging the Christmas tree because he loves it you really <laughs> need to say what pain am I um putting down on the page here what what terrible wrongs do I still feel like the emotions you feel about this shine through every time you write about it so I feel like this is really important and it doesn't have to be Shiva world people reading it to deeply understand what's happening here I, mean, I, I, I just think you should keep pursuing it definitely yeah. and pursue it in its dark direction because it's in there <laughs> sorry yep <laughs> Well, bravo. People are getting into good places. Nicely done. It's a weird fucking world. I know. I know. You know the yeshiva world is so. Yeah. So right about it. Because yeah. there's people in the world. Yeah. You could have so, just thought that people are weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, going to bring, gonna bring us home? Yes. And it is so different than oh, whatever. Good. Good. Joyful anticipation coursing through every fine hair on my body as I rushed down to see what's now under the Christmas tree. I never believed in Santa because my mom didn't want me to ever come back to her and say that she lied to me. Without reservation, I tear into the cartooned paper to find treasures inside boxes, never knowing she went without eating at times through the year to save money to pay to see that tingle of excitement. When stepping out into foster care, that tingle turned to dread, knowing these people and their families didn't really want me there, and the gifts were a stipend from the government that cared even less, and yet everything had, and yet everything that had happened between my mom and I made me avoid her like the plague during the holidays, because I couldn't carry her sadness and my own over missed traditions like one candy cane off the tree a night leading up to the special birthday of the one we thought we owed our lives to. Now I'd rather give that life back to that one and ask for another. Isn't there a party game that allows you to trade gifts with someone else? Maybe it's time for that tradition. Woo! I just want to write one thing. Thoughts, people. Wow. I didn't realize that the whole theme, by the way, of my prompt was disillusionment, which I just spelled wrong. <laughs> I typed too fast. Go ahead. I really liked how you set it up. Like with like, my mom didn't want me to say that I, she ever lied to me. So like we go and be like, okay, character knows there is no Santa, which was like kind of shocking because a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, there is this, like, magical figure who's going to give me gifts. And so, like, that's such, like, a uh, part, at least around here, about the big part about um, growing up. Um, but then the party game and not knowing and that sacrifice, there, I got lost at one point in a good way. And I couldn't write out the whole thought, but, like, that couldn't carry my sadness or her sadness. Because then I was, like, thinking about the candy canes and, like, just seeing your characters with the, oh. It was very vivid where like I had the movie in my head. Thank you. Uh, for me, it was the flips back and forth with the emotions. So at one stage, it seemed like your mother was, the mother was being really nice because she's skipping meals, but then, and not making you lie. But then at the end, the the relationship is that, you know, this hard relationship and the sucky life and I got the feeling like, you know, she was she really skipping meals or was she getting money from the government to buy by presents? Like, you know, which which truth is the truth? And then the the idea of playing white elephant with your life. And I get it. You know, so it was like this whole big thing of like the whole thing is about presence and switching and you know, fighting over what did I get? What did you get? And 
it's just like you know you wanted to get a, a present from your mom and didn't you didn't get a present from your mom you wanted to get your life but you didn't want to get your life so everything was like a, a study in contrasts yeah Randall, do you have anything to add for me the it's kind of just the the idea of it is you know the the ideal of the holiday versus the reality of the holiday and um the the pain that that causes a lot of people like it almost you know it's supposed to be a source of peace and comfort in some some ways it actually exacerbates problems for some people and it almost widens the divide if that makes sense like you've got some people that are suffering some that are in comfort and it actually makes the ones that are in comfort more comfortable and the ones that are suffering and deeper suffering yeah without without even having that intention and there's you know i don't know there's something compelling about that yeah Holidays and and rituals and celebrations and festivities amplify both ends of the spectrum. Nothing mm -hmm. ever just stays status quo through them for sure. Um, I wanted to add, actually, because you mentioned foster care. So I thought that the mom remained such a mystery in this because the same mom who would sacrifice meals and make sure that the the main character has these treats and special presents is the same mom that lost her child to foster care then because this narrator ends up in foster care and of course I had the same thought that all the naive people who haven't been in the system have which is why do people foster kids if they don't want them and I know it's because they get a stipend from the government and they can they can keep the kid for cheaper than the stipend so they make money um, but it was just like the same it still produces anger in me because I don't think people should do that. Um, and then I love this idea that give that life back to that one and ask for another. And it could be that as big of a risk as a, a white elephant exchange. I mean, that's a huge risk if you've ever yeah. participated in a white elephant exchange. Um, and that, it just felt like there was enough in this to turn it either into a prose poem or a flash piece to, to really discuss the idea that um, we we get we kind of get handed the life we get handed the same way that you know you either got somebody didn't know how to do the white elephant you know exchange and you end up with something good right <laughs> um, or you get something that you it's just bizarre like it's so unbelievable you're wondering how you got given it and I think it's an amazing metaphor for you to extend over the nature of life and it fits perfectly with the Christmas theme. So, I mean, it, it seems worth giving some more thought to or including it in your larger work that you're working on. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Y'all never fail to inspire me. I'm gonna turn off the recording. It's been amazing.